Yes, maybe just um, two words about you. Um, you have studied um, cinema, arts and science at the Columbia College in um, Chicago and at the National Film and Television Institute in Accra. And um, uh, Ananda Tiafi is your, your first feature film. And um, I think we feel, um, yeah, there's a lot of references in the film, so we won't talk too much <laughs> from it to yeah. the beginning, but we will maybe discover um, a lot of things um, also related to this um, festival, um, because also there was a reference um, about your films that it um, has to do also with Tuki Buki a little bit, but also with Bonnie and Clyde, it's a road movie. So I think we will have a lot of um, interesting things to discuss um, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out to see this film. Uh, from Ghana to you, we say Akwaba, meaning welcome. Um, you came to see a film, not me. So I'm going to sit aside, let the film do the talking <laughs> so that I, we can talk after outside. OK, All right, thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
then we have a bit of Polish, then of course there is the English, which is the predominant language uh, for narration mostly. Um, each one, like Ghana, we speak so many languages and the rest of the continent, um, they happen as it would happen if you lived in Ghana, where you're hearing a lot of languages, things happening like that. So um, the choice was not so much on my part as it were the situation on the ground. Um, of course, as a director, you cannot pretend not to have also, you're selecting <laughs> and you're deleting and then you're, you're omitting and you're also adding. So um, how come there is, for my part, I'll tell you this. Uh, I say this to my friends and I say this to certain people. I say there's a failure on my side uh, how, for instance, the narration, if you ask me, I prefer the narration to be in at least the language I speak, I speak Cree, and then it's subtitled into English or whatever other language. Um, it says something about who I am, how this film has ended up the way it is, because um, I would say, just like the continent, uh, let's say, the Global South speaks a first language, as it were, that is not our language. You know, it's the effect of this post-colonial hangover we have. And so, I want to believe I think in the language, my, uh, my mother tongue, which is Cree. But up on making this film, I found that the illiteracy inside of me is beyond what I thought it was. Because I can speak it, I can be very colloquial with it, I can joke in it, I can, I believe I dream in it. But when it's time to write it and time to actually make language, to, to, to think in it for a film, to, to translate it into text, you find that for me, I was willing to, I was willing to, I, would, I want to say I was willing to feel bad later that I didn't use my own language than to dis, as it, dishonor the language because I respected to that point that if I spoke that language in a way that is not befitting, I'll have more of a backlash from myself and my community than if I messed it up in English because it's not my language. I'm only learning it. I mean, it's, it's a contradiction, but, you know, this is a question you didn't ask. You didn't even need this. I don't know why I'm still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, language is important uh, again, and this is where, where I want to say something. It's important because cinema's history shows that Again, the Global South colonized people were denied language. It was taken from us. There's an alienation. So the same way these images on the screen are alienating in a subjective point to a lot of us who are used to seeing the image of the space where we come from appropriated in ways that are, I want to say, favorable to commercial gain and to intellectual, academic exercises. <laughs> so to give language back is to give power back because it's like, a, it's what, it's a time capsule. Everything is language. Everything is a is like a code you write for those who come after you and to transmit you know to try is language is important and so to hear these languages even though i'm the maker of the film to to hear these languages spoken back to me does something for me it's liberating it it feels 
is honoring to my person and to those who came before me and those who will come after me. And see, when you make these work, I mean, cinema is culture. And for, again, for those who come after us, a lot of what is filmed is quickly disappearing. I mean, some of the spaces you're seeing, uh, I don't want to say too much about globalization or too much about um, the nature of you know, conglomerates that have descended on the shores of Africa again in an, a new fashion other than what the world knows is really buying up everything and transforming everything. There's nothing wrong with uh, what we call development and growth or whatever, but this erasure uh, that is happening in the real space and happening on screen, so there are two types of erasure happening that I see. One is the one that we, when I say we, um, the people in the, uh, in the global south, the people in the global south are, I, I, I want to refer to Ghana particularly. There are beautiful things in Ghana. There are awesome things in Ghana. But somehow, it seems as though we're erasing some of the reality and we like to fictionalize and like to, we're escapist in that sense because we, uh, our cultural productions are aimed at commercial gain like the rest of the world. But for us who have lost so much in terms of our cultural heritage, we cannot afford to not preserve these images. The, uh, the space we're seeing somehow it needs to be remembered that it was there. And for me, I have no power, and the most I can do is to remember it this way. So for me, a lot of this is also an exercise where it's very personal and selfish before it becomes art. I think I'm just doing my own Q&A. Somebody <laughs> was asking. <laughs> yeah. You have the best seat in the house. You need a question. <laughs> Hi, thank you for this beautiful movie. I think uh, what you said in the beginning is quite striking about, I mean, now we talked about language, but the visual language that you have, the amount of detail that you put in scenes and also the style of it, the fashion, everything is very um, well curated in a way. Um, I was wondering, as you mentioned, um, is there some way, something you want to convey with this kind of viewing, forcing also the viewer to put um, a different lens on, as you mentioned, Instagram, all this fast pacing, social media kind of distracts it from how to view movies or film them as we used to be um, watching them. So what are your thoughts about but, um, behind that or your maybe concept? Um, as a person, I wish I could be like the average, well, there's nothing average anymore. <laughs> I so. I don't think, I don't think like, okay, so I tried rather, let me put it this way. I tried to think the, I, okay, my thought process, I tried to fashion my thought process after what I've been taught in school or how most people around me think or organize space or thoughts. And I've tried many times, you know, as a child to be like everyone else and it's never gone well. And the same happened in film school. I went to film school twice. I have an undergraduate and a postgraduate, you know, in film. And each time it was a problem for me to follow what was asked of me. And I've always failed when I have gone the way people go. But when I go my own way, and I think in not in not in acceptable chronology. I, I think in my own way. My thoughts are a little choppy or disjointed. And it takes time for me to organize them. And you can see some of it on the screen. That and I 
so I also think, I mean, in in regards to, I don't think cinema personally is uh, is a novel. I think cinema is poetry. And just as setting lines in a work of, let's say, a poem, do, they don't. They may be metaphoric. They may be the actual thing being said, but you don't read poetry like you would read any other literature, in, you know. And I feel that the cinema, to me, is more of a feeling. It's 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 poetic um, attributes. It's poetic um, ability work for a person like me. And hopefully, I was hoping that it would find an audience, and it looked like it did. If you watch it again, maybe yes, because usually films are advertised, and you just go and see them, and you're like, so. So yeah, with uh, social media, the truth of the matter is it's not going to go away. Anything, like we say, oh, technology is too this, it's too much, is that. Social media eventually will find its, uh, you know, its place, and we will know what to do with it. But for now, it's going to pose a problem for works like these. And it might also help works like these. But for the most part, we are all trained to move faster on the screen, to view faster, to experience it differently. So, yeah. But there are films like this, and people are trained to watch them. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh. I'll bring it personally to you after she's done. It's probably a quick, quick question. What you just said um, uh, is that the reason why you choose to make a road movie because you virtually wanted to um, um, to pinpoint or to show and to preserve Ghana as you know it and as it is right now. Okay. I'm happy you you know you you're going to help me finish what I said. It's a very so that's exactly the road movie genre works for me because when you're in a car and you're traveling things are not really in chronology. You see somebody getting out of a house, you see another person maybe jumping on a motorcycle or you see somebody taking you know we have outdoor showers. <laughs> so you see somebody's head in a shower you don't see the rest of it. Things don't make sense necessarily. And so for me, the road movie genre allows me also to jump around a bit. And so, again, you didn't ask for that, but I'm trying to build on what I said. <laughs> yeah. You went to film school so. and you decided to make it your career to make movies. It's not and paying the bills. So That's what I'm, I'm getting to, to bread right now. And your portrait, your platform is your country, Ghana. How big is the audience in Ghana for your movies? And to make a livelihood to feed all the people that were part of this movie, you need a lot of money, you need a lot of sales, you need a lot of revenue. Does that mean that your life is traveling the world to promote the, the movies and make enough money for the next movie? Where do you see your life moving for the next 20 years as a filmmaker? Ooh. Ooh. As soon as you took the mic, I was like, I'm in trouble. I could see it coming. I was hoping it would get to you last, but you've asked the question, and I'll be it's like, I have to. not just about the movie. <laughs> the okay. Process. So the process. Um, so this is how I look at it. So the love of my life is sitting right there in that beautiful yellow hat. And she makes it possible for me to take a lot of the risk I take. And knowing that you're making this work that probably will not go anywhere. Because this is not what is hip and sexy. It is sexy for those who know and those who have some taste. So I want to compliment you for that. <laughs> but for the majority of people, Pace, subject matter, superstardom, all those things. And also for distributors are looking for the stardom, the star power to push these works. If you don't have them, it becomes a problem. 
But because this film is of cultural value to me and the whole enterprise of cinema, the whole seventh art as we call it, I, so for, for Global South people, I mean, the whole tri-continental project that has been much talked about, Latin America, Asia, and Africa, cinema is not art for art's sake as it would be in most part of the world, I mean, the West. Um, it was a decolonization, uh, it was for decolonizing the continent to an extent. It's most of its, um, most of it, most of its beginnings came from what we want to call rebels and revolutionaries who were kicking against uh, uh, the colonial powers. And Franz Fanon's text finds, uh, finds uh, this embodiment, finds, uh, finds this conduit through these artists. We're seeing uh, Global Rocha in South America, Gatano, you know, Global Rocha Brazil, we see Gatano from uh, Argentina. We've seen Sajidit Ray from India. We've seen Osman Samben from Senegal. They come from these enclaves to, um, to present, to, to counter the image, to, to give another perspective. Uh, prior to this, Africans, black people like me, brown, were only subject in films to looked at subservient. They were the people that uh, Tarzan was supposed to be kicking against or be throwing signals at. And Hollywood would always have people like me and the continent, Southeast Asia and uh, Latin America as backdrop. When these guys took a hold of the medium, they were here to make a statement. We must also remember that they borrowed from these traditions, these, uh, these styles, these uh, whatever you would call it, these theories. They borrowed and subverted it to their own end. I mean, Italian New Realism was, uh, was the beginnings of uh, Sajidjit Ray, the Apple Trilogy, you see, um, you will see, for instance, Osman Semben's Black Girl. It's coming from places that you could trace, but they subvert it, they make it their own. And of course, Jibril Diof Membeti, who uh, this whole program is about, we, I think we had a conversation, a, a huge, um, is it running again? Uh, are you, no. You guys should see the films before this. Uh, Natasha showed about three films that are rare. It's going to be very difficult to find anywhere. But it showed one of the pioneers, one of perhaps the most enigmatic of all African filmmakers. Um, his beginnings and his thought and how he looks at life. I've lost myself already. We need to get back to the question. <laughs> I get excited and I, I keep going. So... As to how to make a living out of this, the truth is that the system won't let me. And that's how it's built. And so you are important to me and you're important to Gerardo who's sitting at the back because we're excited to, to see how audiences engage with the work. So whenever it's possible to keep pushing the work, we're not just interested in just my work. I'm interested in the work of other makers beyond cinema who are also pushing the boundaries of what is to come. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks very much. I think actually you've started to answer my question uh, already, but indeed maybe building off of the last question, uh, generally, how would you see the state of uh, African cinema, actually, or Ghanaian cinema, for that matter? Um, I mean, indeed, this is an excellent film series, and at least for me, I've also been exposed to, as you said, a number of really eye-opening films uh, through the series. But I wonder, on the continent, is there also a, an awakening or a renaissance, or is this really also a continuation of, I don't know, decades of such filmmaking? 
S- s- yeah. Oh, this is okay. Are we adding the two? Should I answer that first? Okay, so I'll answer it real quick. So you're right. The there is a renaissance of sorts, and I feel every few every f- few years or every decade or so, there's sort of a renewal of energies. You know, there's sort of like a new excitement about something. And not just in literature or in painting or in film, like in life in general, even in technology. And so you would say that perhaps there's one going on, not very many productions, because for the most part, you know, my peers, I can point to one, two, three, but that, that are also interested in these specifics of cultural heritage that manifests itself in these ways. But for the most part, they are what I call NGO films. It's almost like we've been commissioned to make these films for people about Africa or about how things... You will see them when you see them. They have no poetry. And not for every film is supposed to have poetry, at least, I mean, I would say movie, but films, the way I understand them, the image is, the image is always poetry. The image is, it's, it's like a photograph. It, it's photograph is poetry. It's not saying anything. It's, it's what you, what you uh, ascribe to it, you know, and like a painting. Right. Are the drunkards typical uh, for Ghana? Is uh, this your culture you want to preserve if you film? Because I'm afraid that the these two guys are what people sitting here will remember in some days, but not uh, the others. Oh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, do you mind repeating that? Um, it's not a strategy to it's think, but no. I didn't hear everything. <laughs> uh, there are these two drunkards in your oh, film. I see. Are, now are I see they typical? Mean. Is uh, this uh, what you want to preserve? <laughs> I would like to preserve those guys. We need them. They tell truth. The rest of us who are not drinking are really lying. These guys say exactly what they've been. You know, this whole being drunk is a facade so they can say it and get away with it. I love drunks. They're serious human beings. <laughs> yeah. Hassan. Man looks like my friend Hassan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Raquel. Hi. Um, not Hassan, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to your movie um, and to the poetry you were talking about a lot. And first of all, thank you for these beautiful... Thank you for coming. ...and the compositions. And I was wondering, um, like, uh, as you said, this film works more like a poem than like, uh, like a novel. Very long, boring poem. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't say that, but um, my question is, because I think something threw me off in the beginning and I was expecting more of a novel because there was a narration mm. to introduce the story and so I was expecting more of a, I don't know, like an evolving plot in a way and then it wasn't like that and it was really beautiful. My teacher died before I could complete school so I have to go back. <laughs> okay, okay, because my question would have been, um, yeah, why, if it's more of a... Um, more of a poem, more of a disjointed um, collection of of moments and not like one plot which star- has a start and an end. Why having this narration even though the voice is really Good nice question. and it was interesting, Good question. of course. But um, why having this introduction as a narration? That's how I know you're not, Hassan. You're not my friend. You're trying to put me in trouble, so let me go on. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. You're right. I fight with that inside of me. And I told you that one of the problems was for me that I would have loved for it to be in the language I speak, at least for the narration. So back to, it sets it up as if it's going to continue in that fashion and then it breaks away. I mean, it's not all, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with being subversive which is what it might be called, like a subversive. You're thinking this and it does that. Um, I think that 
You see, this is the problem with absolutes or saying that I am different. Like saying I don't watch Netflix, I don't drink Coca-Cola. Like being, the truth of the matter is cinema is consciously constructed. It didn't fall from the sky. I chose to do A, B, C, D. So even though I talk about eschewing all these um, options or for instance, I, I'm not against narration. As a matter of fact, the narration that I feel is the most subversive and the most effective is uh, in the film Itu Mama Tambien. I feel it takes the film somewhere completely. It creates its own film. You, I mean, anybody, I, I would debate anybody on how uh, Alfonso Coran uses Itu Mama Tambien narration. It's beautiful. And uh, if... If I could be on that level of the narration, it would be fantastic. Um, so in answer to your question, there are certain things that no matter how much I want to get away from, the way this film is constructed, they say the film is made three times, when you write it, when you shoot it, and when you edit it. There are perhaps two stages in a film that perhaps didn't have the narration in my mind. And then maybe the third stage that it called for it. Because the absurdist, the absurdism of the film naturally called for it for me. That I could leave it all alone. What I do not, which is where again back to being narrated in what I feel is my language would have elevated it to perhaps where uh, where it's, I mean, for me, narrating in English is not where I would like it to be. And the film is still in my hands, so I can always <laughs> go back <laughs> and do whatever I want to do with it. But so the truth of the matter also is when you are recording your own voice, you have, um, again, we have done with the fact that I couldn't have recorded it in my mother tongue. So let's say now it's in English. Now, narrating it in English was a choice that I made because I, I did not want to appear to not have taken seriously my mother tongue. And it's not fulfilling for me. So once I decided to go the narration route, it's very minimalist narration, even though it appears in a, how many, about four or five places. I don't remember. But it, it also is not consistent, just as the rest of the film is not. So I only draw on it when it calls for it naturally, but the audience can disagree. Because I feel like there are things in the film that do not work. And just like art or just like, I believe in an imperfect cinema. That I am trying to do something and say something, but I, can, I am not able to tie all the knots the way I want to. Perhaps commercial cinema is able to do that very well because they have algorithms for these things. And they really are making sure, they poll people, they put them here and ask them how they feel about the film and change, make changes like screenings, test screenings to make sure it ticks all the boxes. I don't have boxes. I have only one big circle. It goes like that, you know, never ending. My friend Hassan, <laughs> that's for you. <laughs> oh, finally, Hassan is here. Um, could you please say something to the music, which was probably in Ebe, uh, or uh, the last uh, the last singer? So, what does he sing, and uh, what is the function of it in the film? Okay, I'm about to disappoint you, or disappoint myself. So, this is a very special man. And his name's Onipa Nguyen. He passed uh, 
maybe two decades ago. And for the most part, uh, um, other than, for me, again, a feeling, I feel a certain, there's something about his voice. For me, it's always a feeling first, before I find out what else. Now, what he sings about is neither here nor there for me. It's the feeling, and the feeling is that my feeling is also predicated on where I come from. This is a man we took for granted for a long time because he was produced in a setting sense. Okay, so so, so he his initial music, the, the kind of songs we heard from him, we didn't see this in the catalog. Most of us never heard this. The radio kept playing one thing over and over. And it seemed to us something comic, something funny. And again, it comes from that uh, post-colonial hangover that there are so many languages spoken in Ghana. So he's coming from a part of Ghana where the rest of us who are so ignorant in the South, thinking that everyone who comes from anywhere else comes to the South, must conform to all of us, and learn to speak a certain way. If we hear any type of language that does not conform to what we speak, we make fun of it. So he wasn't celebrated, he wasn't famous for his work. Rather, it's the fact that we're laughing at the work rather than celebrating the work. So upon hearing this, because I was going through his catalog, I was listening. You know, there's that point where I'm listening to music and trying to go with the scenes. There's music I found before the film and wrote the scene for. And there's music that I, I chose during the editing. And there's the music that I chose even after the editing to replace setting music. And his was one of those that I'm like, what is he singing about? What is he singing about? So I did uh, reach out to a few people who spoke the language, and they told me exactly what he's singing. The truth of the matter is, if I repeat to you what he said, this thing is being recorded, I, I won't be able to accurately represent it, only that I know that it's not against the scene or it's not counterpoint. But I am celebrating a man and his voice, and what I fail to do to listen to more of his work. And I, like everyone else, was not necessarily celebrating him, but laughing at either whatever he was talking about. I don't know if I make sense. <laughs> Say again. Sorry, excuse me. Yes. So for me, for the, for, the, for the feeling of what this man represents, again, and that voice, I'm sure it did something for you, sir. To want to choose the music and to make this person known. At the same time, if you have a professional music arranger, your movie can be more effective. That's true. If you had a Quincy Jones, mm. he would match the music professionally to every scene. Have you contemplated or considered Quincy's using great. somebody else for arranging music? Um. I'm sure, I, I believe I'm beginning to tap you as the next producer of the film, or you will want to <laughs> lead me. To, you see, I want to be in that space. I, I, listen, all I know is that something is telling me I need to talk to you after here. Because, you know, we, the money is, you know, anybody you bring on board, so... You're, you're going with the feeling. It's time to bring the Quincy on board. I heard, it, you know, he called you last night, so uh, I, I, please don't be nice. Okay, let's talk about this once and for all. We've been doing this dance the whole night. Please, let's do it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, could you please talk about cool people and cool outfits walking through space and cinemascope aspect ratio? <laughs> I told you, beware of these guys, man. That's an Instagram question. I better answer well because I'm live. 
Let me see. Cool people, man. I love cool people. You love cool people too. Um, I I think I know who you're talking about. Um, they they they. I think I think they look good on screen. I mean, Bridget was cast for mainly for her looks, and she had quite a bit of a script to read. And it ends up that she doesn't say too much or doesn't say much. Because what had happened was I'd written overwritten stuff. And each time somebody read it back to you or they try to internalize it, you start to rethink about, I mean, you start to rethink the whole idea of what you were thinking when you wrote it. Because when they speak it back to you, you start re, you know, you, you you start wondering if exact that's exactly what you want. For me, I'm never satisfied with hearing just what I have written. If they can turn it into something else, and that's exactly what they were doing. And most of what I wrote was not. There's a lot of improv in this film because there are things that I wrote that did not fit the circumstances. So when we would rehearse a scene, and I do very little rehearsal, I just want to hear you to see, okay, this is where you start and this is where you end. And I give my actors a lot of room to improv, to add stuff, because the poetry of life is, is, is more beautiful than anything I could ever write. And they keep bringing it back and back again, and they did not disappoint. Um, why You asked me about cool people, right? Like walking through space. <laughs> so why am I asking? Okay. Time, yeah, and, yeah. So exactly. <laughs> okay, so so yeah, so cool. These these cool people, Bridget. I had to take back the script in a sense, and work with what she was giving because she spoke more. She spoke, you know. That's you could see that she speaks in a different way. I had to work with what she speaks with, and um, anyone else who could, I mean, Oricha is good. But if you do something else, we work with it. So cool people, anamorphic lenses, and all of that. Um, I wish I had anamorphic money. I mean, but it's cinema scope very wide. So you write in that sense. And um, uh, Sadiq is pretty much me in a setting sense. <laughs> and um, it's, a lo it's a long story of how he became Sadiq. And maybe I'll say it today. So he... Most of the people are not actors. They are non-actors. So Sadiq showed up as a, a crew member. He was supposed to be assisting me. And so one day we're sitting at dinner table with a crew. And it was the first night that I met him because it had come through a phone, uh, through a phone call that he was the guy going to assist me. And so it was going to be that moment where we we're going to have the conversation of exactly what I need after seeing script and all of that. And I kept looking at him the whole night. He was sitting right opposite me. Everybody's sitting on my side. We're sitting at the ends of the table, the two ends. And I kept thinking about this guy in the white shirt. And I've been looking for, I've been talking to actors. <laughs> and I, I wasn't getting the vibe. So one day I called him, I said, you're Sadiq. So what do you mean? I said, I think you're the guy I'm writing about. So, <laughs> so it took a while. <laughs> yeah. So that's how cool people end up uh, with anamorphic lenses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dinner time? Okay, if there are no further questions, um, we will be still outside for a moment if there. Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, <Anyway>. perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. So, let's see.